Good morning. It is good to see you here today. Thankful that each one of you have chosen to be here and are able to be here. It's a beautiful day today. Great day, though, to be in the house of the Lord, no matter what it is outside. Amen. We're looking forward to our service today. As you know, we do have a special guest with us today. We're looking forward to hearing from Brother Glenn Dowling with the Gideons, and we'll say more about that later. But I do want to go ahead and announce that uh, not only will we have a special guest, but we do want to give you an opportunity at the close of the service to give in a love offering for the Gideons as well. And so we want to go ahead and mention that up front. And so that there will be the opportunity for you to give in that special time at the end of the service. So thankful that you are here with us in our service today. I trust that you have had a great week. Trust that God has blessed you and you're excited about our service today. We don't have quite as many guests this morning as we had last week. I was thinking about it. Maybe we need to find somebody else to baptize every week so we can have lots of guests every week. If that's what it takes, I'm willing to do it. We just need somebody to line up for it, right? But uh, anyway, certainly had a great service last week and uh, thankful for the Lord's blessings in our service and, and our fellows being baptized and our guests that were here. Uh, but we uh, are ex excited and uh, thrilled about our guest speaker today as well. Um, listen, if, uh, if you'll notice in your bulletin, there's a little bitty card-like insert that is in there. That's just a, a little reminder. Most of you should have one. Uh, some of your bulletins may have dropped it, or you may have dropped it as you walked away. We picked up several of them in the floor. If you, uh, Jonathan is ready. He has some of those that have fallen out of some of those bulletins. So if you're missing one, it means yours is one of those and he has in his hands. <laughs> yeah, he'll give that to you. It doesn't mean that you're careless. You just didn't know. So, <laughs> um, But anyway, the insert is just a reminder about our boxes. As you can see behind me, uh, the table is filling up underneath with our boxes, which is what we like to see. Our goal was 100 boxes. We would love to have over 100 boxes. We know that at least 100 boxes have been taken. If you uh, would like more boxes and you are filling those boxes, then uh, please let us know. We can get you more boxes. Don't, don't think that because we don't have any more boxes prepared, they're not in the foyer or anything, that we don't have any more. We can get you more boxes. All right? We will... Gladly do that, just let us know. But that little card is a reminder about those boxes. Please don't fail to get those boxes filled, and please do not fail in getting those boxes into us by November the 14th so that we can return those at the drop off place. Um, I was asked, uh, obviously, this morning in regards to the shipping. Uh, in the previous years, we have had individuals who have covered the cost of shipping for those boxes. At this present moment, that has not been covered yet. If that does uh, become available, we will let you know. The recommended shipment cost for each box is, I think it's $9? $10. $10 per box. That, like everything else that's going up. It was one time uh, a few years ago, maybe, uh, $9 a box. But the recommended coverage or shipment cost is $10 per box. So um, if you do the math on that, um, you obviously know that in the previous times, uh, if we did 100 boxes at $9 a box, that was $900. Well, then that would mean it'd be $100 more this year. I'm not a great mathematician, but I can do that simple math, okay? But anyway, that's, that's what we're looking at. If you have questions about that or if you want to help participate in that, then please let me know as well. Thank you for um, being involved and in giving and sacrificing and engaging in our Operation Christmas Child Boxes. We are thrilled about that. Looking forward to how God is going to bless that. I hope I didn't steal any thunder in regards to that. I, I didn't check to make sure. That's, and that is what You've was done going. the missions moment. Oh, I've already covered it. <laughs> wow. Surely you've got something else you'll say. I didn't hear. I'm sorry. Okay. My bad. <clears throat> well, now you know. But, uh, so uh, let's get those boxes back in. Right. I'm going to be in trouble. I didn't know I was covering that. So there we go. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's take a moment to go to the Lord in prayer. So if you're willing and able to kneel, I'll certainly invite you to do that. But if you don't have room, you're unable, you can stay in your seat or you can stand. Either way, we want to go to the Lord in prayer today. Our Father, as we come before your throne today, we just want to begin by giving you thanks for this glorious morning. 
Thankful for the beautiful weather that you've given us. Thankful for the rain that we've received this past week. We do know, Lord, that all good things come from you, and we are thankful for you and your love for us, your provision for us, and your faithfulness to us. We are thankful, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, the mercies that are new every morning. God, we know that we couldn't be here today. We know that we wouldn't live one moment. We couldn't breathe without you. All that we are and we have, that we have, we owe to you. And so we are grateful, Lord. And there are opportunities that are provided for us sometimes that gives us a chance to give back in, in gratefulness for what you've blessed us with and how good you've been to us. Some of those opportunities are before us even now with our Operation Christmas Child Boxes and as well with our guest speaker today um, representing the Gideons, a great organization that gets the Word of God out in many, many places all around the world. And we thank you, Lord, for these organizations and opportunities that you provide. Father, I just want to pray right now in advance of our regular offering and our special love offering that you would just guide our hearts, Lord, to be faithful to you, first of all, for your blessings that you've given us, and that you would help us, Lord, to be generous as we give. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to just honor you and serve you and worship you in our sacrificial giving as well. And Lord, I pray that you would bless the gift as well, and I pray you'd multiply it and use it mightily to accomplish your great kingdom work. Lord, we know that the, the boxes are a great tool that you use not only to bless the kids with little gifts and trinkets and things that just help them to feel better and, and uh, to get things that they normally wouldn't have in a, in a time of, of giving and, and the time that we celebrate the birth of our Savior, but it's so much more than that. It's a doorway. It's an open path. It's an opportunity that provides others to share with them the love of Christ, the gospel, the good news that uh, is a greater gift than anything physically, materialistically they could ever receive in this life. And so God, we pray that you would just bless this organization and this ministry and uh, the opportunity for us to participate. Bless our service today. We look forward to the rest of our songs. We look forward to Brother Glenn coming and sharing with us about the work of the Gideons and from the Word of God itself as as well, we just pray, Lord, you pour out your spirit upon us. Guide our hearts, Lord. Help us to be in tune with you. Help us to listen to you and help us to obey you today. I pray, Lord, that you would be exalted in all that's done and said. I pray, Lord, you administer to our hearts and help us to respond in faithful obedience. So we give you thanks and we pray your blessings now in Jesus' loving, powerful, and holy name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, at this time, I would like to ask our... Young people, if I borrow a mic, couldn't expect to see it there, to come forward with our Bible Believers verse. All right. If you know the verse, come forward. No one wants to be first. Somebody wants to
we probably don't do as good a job throughout the year of letting them know. We may not even know all the things they do. I'm sure we don't. Uh, for the church and for the work of God, but at least at this time we can make a big deal out of it and uh, show them how much we appreciate them. And so over the last month we've been circulating a card uh, and it has all kinds of signatures and everything in it and there's a little extra something in there that you can pull out as well. We want to let you know we appreciate it. Obviously, we appreciate you, and it is our privilege and thrill to be your pastor. We love you. And, uh, you know, someone says that uh, it's not work if you enjoy what you do. Well, obviously, I love what I do. And uh, there, it is a labor of love, but we love you guys, and we appreciate the opportunity that God has provided for us. And obviously, I had forgotten all about it. I was so focused on our guest speaker and the Bible believers this morning, I totally had forgotten all about that. But thank you so much. We appreciate you guys. We love you so much, and uh, it is our honor and privilege to be here with you. So, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> now back to our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> and going along with our Bible Believers verse to talk about the provision of the Lord and what He provides, number 553 is our first song this morning, He Hideth My Soul. 553, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Oh 
continue our announcements this morning. <laughs> Thankful Brother Doug talked about Operations Christmas Child because I get up here and get nervous and I forget what I want to say. So he covered it. Um, other than the last day is November 13th, Sunday, November 13th. So mark your calendars for that. You've got two more Sundays to get those boxes back into us. And so this morning, Kathy actually sent this video to me three weeks ago, I guess. And it's a really good video that North American Ministries pu published on their Facebook page. And it's a delivery of Christmas child boxes. And so we thought that would be really good for you guys to see today as you've had two weeks to start filling boxes. Two more weeks to go, just kind of right in the middle to see what's going to happen when we get all those boxes back, get them to the processing center, and then they go all over the world. So we're going to watch a video, and then Marcus, would you lead us in prayer at the end of the video, okay? <clears throat> This is the first time we went to do an outreach event basically on the water and I was excited going to the floating village. <laughs> I wondered how churches could be ministering in that place that is remote. All the children had to come to the event with their canoe. We were in the boat and as we were moving around we started singing and there was that old man in his canoe that started singing and dancing with us that old man was celebrating god with us before we get to the village there was this huge canoe with all these children that were singing they were so joyful singing and declaring the power of God. And I remember they had one song that they were like, they were shooting the devil. They are happy singing to the glory of God, happy and trusting that they now have power against the spirit, the evil that they have grown up in. Gospel had reached these people, these children in this area. Those children who received the box initially, they were in the boat singing to the glory of God. And actually they were preparing all that for the new children that are out of the church to come to the knowledge of Christ as well. That's wonderful. I can see that multiplication has started in that church. We get into that church and we have more than 200 children sitting and waiting to receive the gift boxes. When the gift boxes were revealed, you could see how happy they were. They all started shouting, though they haven't yet seen the items in the gift boxes. When we open up the boxes, they are so my children. You can see them shouting, crying, jumping. Some will grab the item and, and wave it and tell the others, look at what I have. And seeing them carrying the gift boxes, going back to the canoe, and then riding away with joy, with excitement, because they are in such a hurry to go back home and have time to actually enjoy the gift boxes that they received. Part of Operations Christmas Child in this country is that volunteers are ready to go any place to just deliver the gift boxes and then share the gospel. We have seen them crossing the lake to carry the gift boxes wherever that is needed. And they are ready to go beyond any limitation just to ensure that the gospel is preached that children are discipled and that multiplication of the gospel is happening.
the opportunity that's provided uh, for us to have a, another way to share uh, your love and, and the gospel of Christ with, with those that we can't even uh, think about coming into contact with in person, but other people provide those means. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for all here uh, at Fellowship as well as uh, so many others uh, that are involved in this effort. And uh, we ask that you would bless all of these uh, boxes that are going out, uh, that they would uh, find uh, the intended receivers that you would have and that uh, uh, your gospel would go with it as well, uh, that uh, we would see souls saved and added to your kingdom and bless those who, who participate in it uh, for their uh, interest and their joy in uh, seeing the gospel shared around the world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we go to our final song, and you can get ready for that, um, just a reminder about our offerings today, if you would like to give to the Gideons either in our regular offering or in the special offering to follow, and you want to do that by check, make that check out to the church. Um, but we will have two op opportunities, both a regular offering and an offering to follow, so um, if you're not ready momentarily, uh, you can do that later. Um, but we want to make sure that that's provided. And if you're unable to give today and want to do it later, that'll be fine too. We can make sure that that makes its way uh, there as well, uh, either in the offering plate or online. So encourage you to do that as the Lord leads you to give as well to, uh, to the Gideons today. I ask you to stand then as we prepare for our final song. Again, going with our Bible believers verse, A Child of the King, number 439. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses.
Thank you, brother. Truly, the, the Spirit of God is in this place. I feel it. I see it in, in your face, and I feel it. And I thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm with my wife, Kay. We just celebrated uh, 60 years. And, uh, and my brother, David Hollingsworth, he's my prayer partner. Uh, he's here to pray for me and to, to make sure that I stay on topic. <laughs> but I think he's going to give me a lot of latitude. As I thought about what I'd say, uh, I had to reflect back that I've been here probably about eight different times, and I want to be careful that I don't repeat things, but on the other hand, I want to be careful that I do repeat things, <laughs> right. because it's all good. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I want to reflect it back. I see a few very here people out there like me and myself. Remember Walter Cronkite? Yeah. From 1962 to 1981, he was the CBS News reporter, and it would come on about 10 o'clock at night, and he would he would do it for a while, and he would tell us what's going on in the world, and his parting, well, he was known as the most trusted man in America, truly. I don't think we have too many like that today, but. And I'm seeing some sort of agreement. But his, uh, his parting words were, uh, and that's the way it is. Yeah. October 30th, 1956, whatever. And people began to think, well, that's the way it is. Whatever he said was the way it was. And then he was succeeded by Dan Rather. Remember Dan Rather? He's a little more current. And he kind of modified that, and he said... Uh, and that's part of our world tonight. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's, that's better. Because he's not just saying that's the way it is, but that's just part of our world. And then we have two uh, major TV networks, <coughs> CNN, and here's what they say. The most trusted name in news. <laughs> I'm not seeing any agreement there. And then Fox says, fair, balanced, and unafraid. So, and here's why I say that. I believe today, truly, the media has become 24 hours, and it is a battle for your mind, and, and a battle for your soul. What they're saying, they want you to not only believe, but buy into. And, and they are not, uh, not necessarily preaching the gospel. Uh, media is big business. It's huge business. And they know this, that readership equals dollars. And bad news, you know, they say good news travels fast, but bad news comes faster. And bad news sells. You know, we turn on the news and you see a train wreck in Germany and you see a, a whatever in Japan and Taiwanese and you're like, well, what can I do about that? But it's bad news. And that's what people watch. And, the, and, and when they cover that, their ratings go up and they can read, they can read the readership and they can negotiate with advertisers as to how much they pay. And some of the advertisers are like $500,000 for five minute ad, a three minute ad. Amazing. But well, we pay for that too in subtle ways. But I don't want to get off too much of that. But I want to talk about the way we we see and perceive things in our world. And I'm going to introduce you to a word that, that you probably don't hear much. I have a, a good friend that I spend time with. He's a, now a widower. And he's a retired librarian. And years ago he taught me this word. Felt on shown. Anybody know that word? If you don't, I, I didn't know it. I never hear it. I have to look it up. But it is your view of life. It's German. Weltanschauung. It's a particular philosophy or view of life. The world view of a group. It's the way you interpret 
the world. Yeah. And we all have a malfunction. And and the, the media does. I want to share with you something I came across. You've heard before, it's been years. Over 250 years ago, the famed English writer Charles Dixon wrote these words, which have been passed down, uh, often quoted through the years. It's relative to the condition of society. He says this, It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season, the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. 250 years ago, that was what he saw. Does that not represent what we see today? A lot like today. Consider for a minute a few ironies or paradoxes in our world today. We just put a James Webb telescope in space and we can see, I forget how many light years away into the, into the, into the past. And scientists are trying to figure out the beginning of creation. But they don't believe in God. I have a friend that's a physicist. He doesn't believe in God. He thought he was an atheist. Because an atheist means there's no God, and, and say there's no God sort of suggests there's something that there's not more enough. But they're trying to figure out when time began, and I, hey, well, I asked him one day, I said, how do you, I said, complete this sentence, in the beginning, and you know what the Bible says, in the beginning, God. And, and I said, David, what is, how would you complete that sentence? In the beginning, he said, the big bang. And so that's pretty good. Who struck the match? <laughs> anyway, well, look at our supermarkets. We go to supermarkets, and they are filled with every kind of food, vegetables, meats, cereals, that you can imagine. Yeah, we've had a few shortages lately, but, but by and large, you go in any supermarket, and it's just full of food. Yet every day, 25,000 people die of starvation, including 10,000 children. Socially, our national war rates have declined. When I was a senior in college, I had a particular lecture called Social Problems. And deviant behavior included homosexuality. We hadn't even heard of transgender. I mean, it was like, that's kind of new. It's not deviant behavior now. I have coffee with a sociologist, some retired A&M retirees, and I asked him one day, I said, you know, why is it not, why, you don't hear it called deviant? He said, Glenn, it's not deviant anymore. It's not only not deviant, it's been normalized, and it's in your face. <laughs> Our defense system. I read some numbers, I can't, I forget the numbers, it's like $3.7 trillion invested around the world in defense. We have enough explosives to blow up, to blow up every man, woman, and child on the planet. Right at the a button. That's crazy. Yeah. Politically, we're more divided on major issues than ever before. And these issues matter greatly to God. Mm -hmm. that's right. And that's why we need the Word of God. So today I want to focus. Brother Doug has done a good job of, of setting up what I'm going to say, but I want to focus. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Okay? And I want to focus on the power and the paramount importance of the Word of God. It's how powerful it really is. Consider. Uh, Perhaps one of the least, or even least, or least quoted books of the Old Testament, Habakkuk. Anybody read that lately? <laughs> Some, it's the last book in the Old Testament. It's just before the Gospel of Matthew. But here's what he says. I've read it before, and, and it's just it's, it's astounding. He says, 
uh, he been he began with an honest yet bleak view of reality. He says, though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stall. Now for an agricultural economy, that's about as bleak as you get. But that's what he says. He applies his faith perspective. He says, yes, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Amen. Amen. That's what, that's what, when that should be our belt on Sean. That's the way we ought to, you know, I was talking to a, a lady a few weeks ago, actually she's on these, okay. And she's dealt with terrible depression. And we're talking and I said, I said, you know, people talk about the glass being half empty and half full. It's both. It's what you focus on. It's what you focus on. Yeah, you can look out and you can let the news people fill your head with, with how pitiful things are. But that's not the that's not reality. The Reverend Jane Kennedy said this. He said, when you read the newspapers and listen to the news, it's not that it's not reality, but it's not the only re reality, and it's not the highest reality. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And Ray Stedman, the pastor, said this. He said, the world is being is drowning in man's words mm -hmm. and starving for the word of God. That's right. <laughs> Even for Christians in First Corinthians, it says this. It says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am not. So the prism through which we look at life or the, the lens, however you view that, ought to be that of faith. Looking at the cross. The Bible says, uh, He would keep the imperfect peace his mind is stay on me. Yeah. And, and we need that so much. As businessmen in good state with our church, we as get to understand that we are at best farmers. We know that we plant a seed, that's all we do. But we know when we plant that seed, the, the fruit is out of our hands. God will cause that, that seed to germinate and bear fruit. It's interesting, it's providentially, when I say providentially, I mean that literally, that God provides. So many times before I make a church presentation like today, because you've heard this scripture, I, this, this scripture just floats up. Because when it rains, I look at it and say, rain, I think of Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. And it says this, you, you don't have to close your eyes, but just visualize. It says, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, make it bear forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sin it. But we know well this, the, the sole value of any guarantee hinges on one thing, the guarantor. Yeah. Yeah. The guarantor. And we know who guarantees our, our salvation. Amen. Gideon's in effect, we, or we see ourselves as, as an extension of Fellowship Free Will Baptist and other churches that we that we serve. We give church reports to tell you the, the fruits that we see. We get letters. We at our national convention we have speakers that come and usually they're pretty powerful and you're going to hear two today. I don't think you've heard these. Uh, if you have, uh, you'll just be blessed once again. 
Consequently, of this, this past Wednesday, we gave out over 10,500 New Testaments like this, for the exit rain. And over the years we've done this, it's, it's changed. You know, 20 years ago, you know, we'd be standing there and the kids are kind of class and you're handing out scriptures and, and they're saying howdy and they're taking one. And, and you know, we've given out as many as 16,000. But now, somehow, it's changed. You know, we've got earplugs and cell phones and they're walking and they're not even looking at you. And so you just, you can live with that. And you stand there and every now and then you just walk up and say, would you like this? But they're not talking. And what is this, you know, and what's all? And, I mean, they're, they're truly interested. But, but the other thing that we've got that's really neat, I don't know if I can find out if I can. Well, it's, it's a little card, it's called an app card. That app card, you can, you can, you can read it on your phone. It has 1,846 languages. You can download it, you can punch into it, you can look up your language, punch into that. It will read the scripture in your language. Or you can read it to yourself. And uh, there was a story of a man who got in a cab in New York and he could tell the driver was international and he asked him, you know, where are you from? And it was like Tanzania somewhere. What's your language? He told him and so he punched up that turned it on. Start playing. He said, What well, what is that? And he said, Yeah, well, that's would you like to have it? And he said, he took it. It's like amazing. So, you know, the the get in where we're old, we're the old guys, but you know, we've got technology too. And we can get in there <laughs> with the best of them. So uh, with that I want to just pause for a minute and and have uh, have you view a video. Uh, and this young lady is from what used to be called uh, Colombo Salon. It's now called Sri Lanka. Her name is Jamili Panella. So if we can see that video, that video just then <coughs> below India and um, my parents grew up there and I was born there and they moved us to the United States when I was about one year old and although I lived in the States since then um, my parents raised us in a very traditional Sri Lankan home and part of that means um, growing up Buddhist so we grew up going to temple every Sunday learning the teachings of Buddha and the prayers and singlies and um, we were just in a very tight community of Sri Lankans, and, and so growing up, I never questioned anything that I was learning. Um, I never really went outside of Buddhism. I was just very comfortable in that, and so that's my upbringing, and then I came to A&M, um, the college I go to, my first year, and it was the first time I was away from my very strict parents, <laughs> and um, first time I was away from them, and just you meet so many people your first year and you just have a lot of different conversations. And so people would ask me, you know, like, where are you from? Like, what country are you from? And like, what language do you speak? And what religion is the predominant religion there? So I would talk about Buddhism for the first time to other people and they would ask me questions about it and I found that I just, I could not answer their specific questions about the teachings of Buddhism. I couldn't explain it as if I truly understood it, you know? And, the more I would talk about it, the more questions within myself I would form. You know, I felt like Buddhism did not address how the world was created in the very first place. And I didn't feel like karma, that idea of karma and reincarnation, that process, was explained very well. I just had all these questions. And so I was walking on campus, and you've probably met a girl like me before. I am the girl that does not make eye contact with people when, that are handing out things on campus. And I try and just play, be on my phone or something and, and ignore them so I don't have to take what they're giving out. But um, this particular day, you know, I think it was because it was a group of men as opposed to students, but I just 
saw them and I made eye contact with the man and he seemed very nice and so <laughs> my hand just went out for what he was giving out which was this little book and um, I just took it and I remember feeling embarrassed that I had taken it and so I put it in my pocket right away and um, I just went straight to my dorm and I started reading it. I just opened it and started reading it. I opened up to the first book, which was Matthew. I didn't know that at the time, but um, started reading Matthew and the rest of the Gospels. And I heard about this person, Jesus, and I'd heard his name before in school and things like that, but I had no idea about his teachings or, you know, his ministry and the miracles he performed. I it was completely a new experience for me to even hold a Bible and read it. And so um, it, it felt very weird, but I just would read and new questions would come up. And during this period of time, um, my family life at home was not going very well. Um, my parents decided to separate and eventually they got a divorce. And during that time, it was just very apparent to me that, you know, human nature is, is very, we're just very easily prone to hurting one another and causing pain and, um, you know, just being prideful and all these things. And so I was very confused as to, like, how are we this way? Why are we this way? So when I was reading the Gospels and reading the New Testament, um, I found the answer to that, which was, we are sinful and we, we were born this way. It is, we are inherently this way. We are sinful inherently. And, and so once I started to somewhat understand that concept, um, it took, you know, weeks and a couple months, and I decided to accept the Lord. Um, I accepted what Christ had done on the cross for me and the, the way he provided out of that sinful life and into a relationship with the Lord. And so um, I wanted to tell my family this really exciting piece of news um, in my life, and I told my mother first. Um, my mom is a very devout Buddhist. She very much just very religious in that sense, um, always went to temple, and so she was very disappointed with the decision I had made. Um, she believed I had accumulated a lot of bad karma with becoming a Christian. And so um, she told me, really though, she told me that um, I would be born like something below a human in my next life because of how much bad karma I'd accumulated. Um, and so that was very difficult, and um, she chose to not speak with me or see me for these past two and a half years. I've tried to contact her, but um, she just was very disappointed with that decision. And um, in our culture, you know, to disobey your parents, to, to go a different path is, is not encouraged. You, you don't do that. And so, she, yeah, she was not happy with that decision. But praise the Lord, the next year after I accepted the Lord, my younger sister accepted the Lord. So, I don't know. Um, so, he is doing a lot of work in my family, and I can't deny the fact that it all comes back to the very beginning that he sovereignly placed me in the path of these Gideons on my campus, and I somehow, really weird for me, took what they were handing out, you know, and um, I'm so thankful to the ministry of the Gideons. I, the more I learn about this ministry, the more I imagine the faith it takes to pack up the New Testaments in the boxes and pray over them and send them out across the world, across campuses, and you don't know what the people will do with them once they're in their hands or the choices they'll make, and you pray for them, and I'm just so thankful for your obedience to the Lord and just being willing to yeah, be doers of the word, like this conference you know, is talking about. And, in my life, you know, it's just, I'm overwhelmed at the change in my life. It's complete 180 from four years ago. And so, so yes. So yes, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do. Thank you. We purchased these for $1.35, and we have for 25 years. And for $5, we purchased these, and we have for 25 years. And I really go on that. Uh, and we, we put these in hotels and motels uh, throughout the 
you know, space and, and around the world in a hundred languages. Uh, a number of years with A&M, we were planning a camp, a, a, a camp in Koryama, Japan. And, uh, and I checked the our Gideon Bible, and I found the Gideon Bible. I also had a Buddhist Bible there. And so I, uh, I swiped that Bible. <laughs> Now, we want you to have the Bible. We want you to take them because we, we, uh, we have to service the motels and, and replace the Bibles. But, uh, but I just took it because I just wanted to see one in, in Japanese. And then uh, uh, and I put it on my bookcase right above my computer terminal. And I was giving a, an evening presentation in New Baden. And so when I arrived, it was just kind of a small church and pastor called me inside and said, he said, uh, my wife and I just got back from our 30th wedding anniversary and I really don't have anything prepared, so you can have as much time as you want. That's pretty risky. <laughs> so I, you know, I shared uh, any, any, everything I could think of and I had taken that little Bible with me just to tell him the story. Well, when it was over, the young lady from the work to Texas and came up and she said, John, I have this friend in Japan and, and I'm trying to find her Bible. <laughs> Again, a little providence there. Yes. But um, but we give out Bibles and we don't know who's going to pick them out. And you don't know. It could be my son, my daughter, your son, your daughter, your grandson. We don't know. It could be uh, a man, traveling salesman, Great temptation, and we hear work, we hear stories that covers the waterfront about when people reach in and find the Bible and start reading it, and what and what it does. It's just it's amazing because we do know the Word of God is powerful. As Hebrews says, it's sharper than it's alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces the, the thoughts and the and intentions of the heart. It, it it's the only book that you read when the author shows up. Amen. It's, it's not black ink on white paper. It's living. Now, I want to I want to, like to view another video of this, uh, this lady. Her name is Tiffy Brown. I was tell you she's from Oklahoma, and she now lives in Texas, but I won't steal her story. I was raised in the church. I knew about Jesus. Well, I know about Prince William, too. I don't know him. There's a big difference between knowing about somebody and knowing them, isn't there? I got married right out of high school. It was a bad marriage. We had three children. It ended in 1968. I left Florida, went back to my hometown of Oklahoma City, started looking for work. I found a job illustrating children's reading books, bringing home $65 a week. And of course that wasn't going to make enough, so I had to work a second job. And I always thought I could sing, but I wasn't sure I could do it professionally. But starvation will give you a lot of courage. So I auditioned and... Uh, much to my shock, they hired me. And so there I was, Oklahoma City's new jazz queen. And uh, so I was working two jobs, and it's kind of hard to raise a family when you're never there. I was never home. And my girls began to get in trouble. And it just went on and on, and it was bad. I sent my son, Tommy, back to his dad who would remarried down in Florida thinking it would just be a short amount of time until I got those girls straightened out. Well, they didn't get straightened out. They went to prison, both of them. And it was a hard time for all of us. 
Well, some time went by, they got out and kind of went their own separate ways, and by then I had put a show band together, and I looked just like Cher in those days. Can you dig it? <laughs> and uh, I hit the road with my band. My two brothers got very sick about that time. My oldest brother, Don, was a dentist in Birmingham, Alabama, and he got multiple sclerosis. And my brother, Jim, was a plant manager with Union Carbide, and he got leukemia. And instead of becoming bitter, both of them turned their lives over to Jesus Christ. And they started praying for me. Guess you know what that does. Put me on the holy hit list. <laughs> And as I traveled, I literally lived in hotel rooms and motel rooms, sometimes two and three weeks at a time. Guess what's in all those hotel rooms? <laughs> Bibles, place for the Gideons. Thank God for you Gideons. And when you're looking for answers, you'll pick those things up. And I was definitely looking for answers, and so I began to pick them up. And of course, we all know the Bible is the only book in the world where every time you open it, the author shows up. <laughs> and he showed up. Can you, can you imagine the Holy Spirit on the road with a rock man? He was there. Aren't you glad he doesn't care who he hangs out with? Thank God. And so I would open it up and he'd show up and he would minister to my heart through the word of God quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And that word began to work in my heart. And I read a scripture in John 3, just below John 3, 16, where it said, Men love the darkness because their deeds are evil. And that scared me because for the first time in my life, I realized I was in darkness. And I did not have that light I had been reading about. And that scared me, and that put me on my knees at a Holiday Inn in Owensboro, Kentucky, crying my eyes out. And I asked the Lord to forgive me of all my sins and to come into my heart. And he wasted no time at all. He'd been waiting for that prayer for 38 years. And I got up off my knees, a brand new little baby Christian, didn't have a clue as to what to do next, so I did what I always did, went right back down on the stage. And I got down there and I looked around, and first thing I said was, how come it's so dark in here? <laughs> it wasn't any darker than it always been. It's just that the light of the world had moved in. And when he crawls up from behind your eyes and he's looking around, nothing looks the same ever again. And the second thing I noticed, and this is kind of weird, I loved everybody in the room. I thought, what am I supposed to do with this? I thought well, maybe a loving thing would be to tell them what I'd learned, which wasn't much, it was more they knew, so I started telling everybody in the nightclub about Jesus. <laughs> And that went over like a screen door in a submarine, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> they really didn't want to hear it. Isn't that funny? The thing we need to hear the most is the thing we want to hear the least. But I couldn't help myself because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that was big in my heart, so that's what came out of my mouth. Well, that got me fired. <laughs> and that happened in San Angelo, Texas in August of 1977. And I left my band, left a message for them not to ever try to find me, not to look me up. And I went out and got in my car and said a little prayer. I said, Lord, I don't know what you want with me. But from this day forward, you have my undivided attention. He sure had, I sure had his undivided attention on that cross. And I started driving north. I figured I'd hit Oklahoma somewhere. I didn't know where to go. So I started praying about that. And pretty soon, I started getting this kind of homesick feeling for Lawton, Oklahoma, where I graduated from high school in 1957. 
I'll wait while y'all count it up. <laughs> I had no reason to go back there. I had not communicated with any of my classmates in 20 years. My parents didn't live there anymore. But I just longed to look up my best friend in high school, Catherine Stanley. So I got there and I looked her up and she invited me to come over and spend the night. And as I drove over there, I thought, she's going to think I'm crazy. She's going to ask me what I'm doing here. I don't know what I'm doing here. First words out of her mouth, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> and all I have is the truth. So I start, started telling her everything that happened to me. And pretty soon she lets out with a great big, well, praise the Lord. Like to scare me to death. <laughs> This is great. I'm going to have all the ladies in the church come over and meet you in the morning. <laughs> I said, oh, swell. I was not thrilled. I didn't think I had the clothes to meet the ladies in the church. You know that one? Hello? Well, all I had was tight jeans and a t-shirt with something stupid written on it. It was either that or something wild and glittery that I wore on the stage, and I thought, wonder which one I would put on. <laughs> so I found my least tight jeans, my least stupid saying on my t-shirt, and brushed out that long black sheer hair, came walking out, scared to death. And I just stopped in the hallway and said a little prayer. I said, oh Jesus, please let them love me. Little basic need we all have. So I took the big plunge. I stepped into that kitchen and those ladies turned around and they looked at me, grinning like a bunch of horses eating briars, you know, just <laughs> And they just loved me, thank God. If they ever saw that stupid saying on my t-shirt, they were very careful, never let me see their eyes traveling across it. And they came over and put their arms around me and welcomed me into the family of God. And for the first time in my life, I understood what the church was all about. Because Jesus said, they'll know you by your love. And these ladies personified the love of Jesus Christ. And this one lady was so cute, she comes up, I just can't wait to hear you testify. <laughs> I sit against two. <laughs> See, my daddy was a judge. I knew what that meant. <laughs> and they left, and we had a nice time, and I told Kathy, I need to call my kids. And uh, my first prayer after I came to Christ was, Lord, please let me have all my children back. I got my daughter Mindy on the phone and she invited me to come to Greenville and start my new life with her. And so I went to Greenville, found a job, found a church, began living my new life in front of my child and I blew it sometimes. I haven't backslided and blew it sometimes. Nobody else blown it yet. Wow, what a holy group. <laughs> I bet y'all just glow in the dark, don't you? Nobody else blown it yet? Like every day, right? Especially with this. My daughter April came to Greenville, moved in with us, started going to church with us. She gave her heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. My son came to live with me. He gave his heart to Jesus. And my granddaughter is now in Connecticut with her husband planting a church up there. And all my children, my grandchildren, all because of some busy men called Gideons placing Bibles in motel rooms. Thank you. Pretty hard to follow. In. <laughs> and originally, I, I heard that we're planning to go to the moon again. And I remember standing in my backyard, I believe it was in 1969, looking up at the moon and realizing that there were two men, Neil Armstrong and Bud Aldrin, walking on the moon. 
hard to imagine, hard to imagine. And it's not about going back and even going to Mars, but Armstrong's famous quote that one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind has been repeated a thousand times and will be, I'm sure, throughout your life and mine. And there's another story that about Buzz Armstrong that um, Neil Armstrong that I came across. One you likely have not heard took place in, in 1994, 25 years after the moonwalk when Neil Armstrong was 64 and visited uh, Holy Land. The uh, archaeologist guy told Neil Armstrong, he said, uh, these are the steps that led to the temple. So Jesus must have walked there many times. And Armstrong asked, uh, are these the original steps? And the guy said, yes, they were. He said, so Jesus stepped right here and asked Armstrong, that's right. And the guy assured him. He said, I have to tell you, I am more excited stepping on these stones than I was stepping on the moon. You don't hear those stories. But they're out there. <coughs> and we talk a little bit about the power and the supreme importance of God. Where have you seen it? You've seen it in two lives. You've experienced it. That's why you're here. You know the love of the church. You know you sense the spirit. And first I'd say this. When I was 40 years old, I had lunch with my pastor and I posed him with a question that he and I both remember. I said, look, you're, you're paid to, to read the Bible and study and pray. I, you know, what about us you know, guys that are not in the ministry? And so he told me very simply, he said, well, he said, uh, Monday morning you get up and you read your Bible. You can read a psalm or proverb five minutes. He knew you can't do it for five minutes. If I did it for five, ten minutes, and all of a sudden it get in the 15 minutes, and then I gotta get ready and you have to turn around. So long story short, here's what I'm saying, and I, I'm not preaching to I'm just saying that we need to feed on the word of God. Yes. We don't need to snack on it. It's not something you go to and, well, where's the Bible always come? Let's dust it off, you know, and make your grandma's favorite scripture. No, that's not it. That ought to be yours. That word is for you. Amen. It's meant for you. And the strange thing I find about the Word of God is you can read a scripture that you've been reading for years. And it says something different. Did that mean it change? No, it doesn't. It just, it, it just applies differently. You understand it differently. So I would encourage you, as strong as I can, to feed on the Word. We need the Word. It is the, you know, we're in a battle for the mind every day. And we're supposed to put on the, the breastplate, the, the belt of truth. That's Jesus Christ. The breastplate of righteousness. That's Jesus Christ. Gospel on your faith. That's Jesus Christ. The shield of faith. That's Jesus Christ. The helmet of salvation. That's Jesus Christ. The only offensive weapon we have is the sword. Mm -hmm. The word of God. Mm -hmm. But we need to be in battle. Because we're in battle every day. Right. Pastor Doug, I thank you for this privilege of speaking to your congregation uh, not many pastors give up their pulpit to us. We get, I've had as little as three minutes. And I can do it in three minutes. Believe it or not. I can do it. We had three services, Christ United, three services, one on Sunday. And we have three Gideon spoke, and we did three minutes of peace. So with that, I want to say thank you and bless you. I appreciate Lynn. I
appreciate the Gideons and I appreciate what they do and it is a thrill to have them to come and to stand in this pulpit and not only share from the Word of God but share what God's Word is doing and they see it all the time. I remember the first um, time that I was exposed to a Gideon representative back in Florence, Alabama and uh, I already knew the person before I knew that he was a Gideon and began to expose me to what Gideons did and then I made connections I was like well, I remember getting the Gideon Bibles when I was a child. And I remember getting a Gideon Bible when I went in the Army. And so those things connected. And I was suddenly then very uh, drawn to the Gideons. And so my natural response was, I believe in you guys and what you're doing. Once I found out exactly who they were and what they were doing, I want to be one of them. Right? I was so impressed and thrilled. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to participate with well, that's great, but you can't. I was devastated. Why can I not? Because you're a minister. And Gideons are uh, an organization of laymen that they don't allow ministers, whether you pastors or pastors, to participate in their, in their organization. It's not because they don't want us, but they want to partner with us. They want us to be partners together with them. And so that's the wonderful thing about who they are and what they do. So that just kind of floored me at first and it disappointed me, but the other time, on the other side of it, it gave me a greater appreciation for who they are and what they do. I believe in the Gideons and I believe in their great worthy calls and thankful for the Bibles that they have put out and that they continue to put out. And I trust that you do as well. And so thank you, Glenn, again for coming. And every uh, time, every, by the way, every year they put on a luncheon for the pastors in this area. And uh, it's a number of pastors that come together and they feed us very well. And then they share some stories such as what you heard here uh, in the presentation today. And there, it's never ending. There's always someone's story of a life that was totally changed because of Gideon Bible. So I believe in them. And uh, I want to give you the opportunity to participate and share in the wonderful work that they do. And we want to receive our offering for that this morning. So we'll ask our ushers if they would go ahead and come now. We'll ask you to stand at this time. And we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And we want to give you an opportunity to give in this offering as well. Now, some of you may or may not know, but one of our own is as well. One of the Gideons and Brother Jim Brewer is a, a Gideon as well. So, Brother Jim, I'm going to ask you if you would to lead us in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word mm -hmm. that's able to save us and Lord, keep us saved. And God, give us a better life. And God, I pray that you would help us to take the words that we've heard, the testimony and your scripture today and apply it to our lives. Mm -hmm. God, that we might be better servants of yours and God that we might make heaven our home when our time comes God just bless the uh, offering now I pray that you would just help everything uh, that's uh, going forth in your name that you would bless it and it would prosper and souls be added to your kingdom for your glory in Jesus name Amen, amen.
so much again for being here today. We appreciate you being with us. And again, we're so thankful for Brother Glenn and his wife. And I forgot the David. David being with us as well today. And certainly, we've already invited him to stay and enjoy the lunch with us. Hope that you will uh, enjoy that time with us as well. I'm going to ask Brother Glenn and David and his wife that they'll make their way to the foyer. I know some of you will go around this way, but if you want to greet them and thank them for being here, I want to give you that opportunity. So if you guys will go ahead, we'll appreciate that. And then we'll make our way over in a moment to enjoy the chili lunch with you as well. Brother Randall, if you would, good, good to see you back this morning. If you would, ask the blessing on our meal and our dismissal as well. We appreciate it. 